coming up on Network Africa. Former South African President Jacob has a virtual corruption trial from jail. Ethiopia's Tigray conflict spreads to neighboring states. Plus, Ethiopia meets second year target for filling disputed dam on River Nile. Hello and a warm welcome to the program. I'm Tenyo Alash Ali. From a deadly fuel tanker explosion in Kenya to South Africans celebrating Mandela Day following a week of violence and looting, we begin the program with news and stories that made headlines over the weekend. Saturday, 13 people were killed and many others seriously injured when an overturned petrol tanker exploded in western Kenya as crowds thronged to collect the spilling fuel. The fuel truck collided with another vehicle in a busy highway between Kisumu and the border with Uganda. On Lucas rushed to the scene with jerry cans, but the cargo exploded, engulfing those around in a fireball. Yeah, yeah. Also on Saturday, South African authorities in the port city of Durban said they were investigating a coastal chemical spill that may have been caused by a warehouse fire during unrest last week. Authorities say other possible sources are also being investigated as a cause of the spill, which is affecting marine and bird life. <laughs> Meanwhile, on Sunday, as South Africans mark Nelson Mandela Day, President Cyril Ramaphosa called on the people to join the cleanup efforts to rebuild the country after the unrest and violence seen last week. He also said the government would defeat the invisible enemy that has infiltrated the country. We were infiltrated. There were people who came in, this invisible enemy that we are fighting, which we must continue to fight and defeat. And I can say we are going to defeat them, because they are not equal to the strength that we have in relation to young people like you, our government, our security forces, and the people of Soweto and the people of South Africa. Also marking Nelson Mandela Day, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said Mandela's call for solidarity and an end to racism are particularly relevant today as social cohesion around the world is threatened by division. Nelson Mandela International Day is an opportunity to reflect on the life and legacy of a legendary global advocate for dignity, equality, justice and human rights. Each year on this day, Nelson Mandela's birthday, we pay tribute to this extraordinary man who embodied the highest aspirations of the United Nations and the human family. Madiba's calls for solidarity and an end to racism are particularly relevant today as social cohesion around the world is threatened by division. Societies are becoming more polarized with hate speech on the rise and misinformation blurring the truth, questioning science and undermining democratic institutions. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has made these ills more acute and rolled back years of progress in the global fight against poverty. As always, in times of crisis, it is the marginalized and discriminated against who suffer the most, often while being blamed for problems they did not cause. The pandemic has shown the vital importance of human solidarity and unity, values championed and exemplified by Nelson Mandela in his lifelong fight for justice. No one is safe until all are safe and each of us has a part to play. Let us be inspired by Madiba's message to each of us, that each of us can make a difference in promoting peace, human rights, harmony with nature, and dignity for all. Let us all honor Madiba's call to action and be empowered by his legacy. And finally, in West Africa, presidential elections took place on the island of Sao Tome and Principe on Sunday. Although most power is in the hands of the Prime Minister, 19 candidates are vying to take over from Evaristos Cavallo, who is stepping down as president after a single term. To our main stories now, South Africa's former president, Jacob Zuma, has appeared on a video link from prison to attend a corruption trial. 
Mr. Zuma faces charges of fraud and racketeering dating back to the 1990s. This is the first time he has been seen since he was sent to jail for contempt of court, a move that sparked a week of looting and arson in South Africa and also led to the death of more than 200 people. The 79-year-old has now spent more than a week in prison after he was found guilty of contempt of court for refusing to participate in a separate corruption investigation. The trial began in May but has faced several postponements and delays as Mr Zuma's legal team sought to have charges dropped. Today, the former president's legal team petitioned for the trial to again be delayed, arguing a defendant has a right to appear in court in person he had previously physically appeared in court during the opening of the trial to proclaim his innocence. Our South Africa Bureau Chief Betty Dibia joins us now for more on this. Betty, you know, it's getting a bit difficult to keep up with all the uh, legal cases involving the former president. But at the resumption of this uh, corruption trial, which is, is stemming, uh, stems from a 1999 weapons cell, Mr. Zuma briefly appeared in court via video link, and his legal team argued that he has a right to appear in court in person. Just talk us, uh, to us briefly about that, Betty, and what happened at the proceedings. Okay, uh, don't worry, Tenny. It's a maze that many of us get lost in, but we try to keep up uh, bit by bit. Uh, but uh, former President Jacob Zuma appeared before Judge uh, uh, Pete Cohen today at the Peter Ma Well, not physically. Uh, the case came up at the Peter Maritzburg uh, Ma uh, High Court. Yes, High Court. Um, and um, what he was seeking is a, a week's postponement, you know, to speak with his lawyers because he, according to him, he didn't get to meet them because of the violence that gripped the nation um, uh, last week or the most of last week and, and the week before. Um, so he's asking for that. Um, that's different. We've been told that this is an application within an application. So on resumption, you want to enter a special plea on why uh, he should be acquitted without any trial, like the whole case of the trial for the 1999 uh, uh, arms deal to be dropped and that he should be set free on, on the, the charges that have been brought against him. Of course, the National Prosecuting Authority refused, uh, saying that uh, there is no need. When his lawyers were saying that it's a violation of his rights according to the relevant sections of the Criminal Procedure Act, you know, that uh, it's a violation of his right if he doesn't appear in person, to make to present or, or enter that special plea that he's he's talking about, the prosecuting authority, the national prosecuting authority, refused, uh, saying. But but then it's up to the judge. Uh, I think we'll get to hear how this will end by tomorrow, uh, because the judge doesn't really want to spend a lot of time on this case. He wants to get it done. It's been over 17 years uh, uh, and still counting, and the delay. You know, it, it's harming the case, uh, so to speak. But I understand again that this is apart from the case that he may be allowed to attend if he wants, if, if he applied to to do to, to attend his uh, brother Michael's uh, funeral, which will happen I think Wednesday or Thursday. But then he's he's uh, back in again. All right, Betty. Considering the mass unrest we saw last week, what measures did the authorities put in place ahead of this? And were there any demonstrations in any part of the country today? Well, it was a virtual hearing, so, so nothing. People are still counting their losses. There is fear. There, so nothing was put in place to bring it to court. It had already been uh, uh, announced that it would be a virtual, um, a virtual hearing. So remember, we're in third wave uh, of COVID. There's a surge right now going on that we're dealing with. So no, um, usually when he appears in court, a lot of people come, apart from the politicians, regular people on the ground, uh, come to catch a glimpse of him and the usual dance and, and address that he does outside the court. Of course, it won't be uh, in the interest of security to even let that happen at this time. Nobody knows where that will end. So nothing was put in place, and it had been announced that it will be uh, a virtual uh, hearing this particular case. 
All right, then. Uh, President uh, Cyril Ramaphosa has blamed what he calls infiltrators uh, for inciting the violence and looting uh, seen last week. Any idea who these statements are directed at? And is anyone likely to be charged uh, for this? Uh, we understand from uh, the NPA that three people are, or the police minister, that three people are already in custody. Um, one appears in court at the really court, uh, magistrate's court. The bail uh, hearing has been, uh, our application has been postponed. But he is a member of a, a small opposition party, the Patriotic Alliance. Uh, his name is uh, Bruce uh, Nimerhout. I can call his name now because he's already been, uh, he's already been brought to court. The others cannot be named. Um, according to the police minister, there are other names on that list. Uh, initially, we heard from uh, the president and other government officials that some of the people who have orchestrated this, allegedly, uh, some of the security operatives that may have worked with the former president. Uh, but now, these are uh, there are other regular individuals, you know, who either passed voice notes around telling people to come out and shut down. But interestingly, a lot of people are saying, now we have the Zuma children, uh, Edward and the, um, Duduzile, that's the daughter, you know, calling people out to, to shut down the country for the yeah. freedom of, of, of their father. So they're saying, so what is going to happen? We've not, had, we've not been given answers regarding those ones. Um, but then again, the, the, what they call hashtag PJ Kogzuma has given the president 15 days to set the, the former president um, uh, uh, free, or, or, or we don't know what, because I asked um, um, one of their leaders, so what will happen? He didn't really make a categorical statement, but we're waiting to see what will happen, that he had to let him go, uh, that the president should let him go, or it's hanging, we don't know. Yeah, Betty, you know, uh, a lot to keep our eyes on. We do hope that the same violence seen last week won't happen again. Uh, thank you so much for bringing us up to speed. Thank you so much. Well, away from South Africa to Ethiopia's Tigray crisis, the conflict is showing further signs of spreading to other areas with fighting now reported in neighboring Afar state. The government has accused the Tigrayan rebels of attacking civilians and blocking aid, but the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, TPLF, say they are targeting government-aligned militias in the region. The TPLF said their attacks along the Afar border over the weekend were very limited though the government accused the group of using heavy artillery. Fresh fighting along the Afar Tigray border could hinder humanitarian efforts, making things worse for civilians in war-torn Tigray. On Sunday, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed said that the army and forces from the regions are taking positions to crush the TPLF. More regions, including Somali, Gambela, Harari, are now mobilizing their forces to join the fighting. What's one other issue? The Ethiopian government says it has met its second year target for filling a dam on the river now and says it plans to start electricity production within months. The controversial multi-billion dollar dam has stoked tension with both Egypt and Sudan. The authorities in Cairo say they are extremely concerned that the country's water supply will be affected by the project. Ethiopia's Minister of Water says there's now enough water in the dam's reservoir to operate two turbines. The three countries have held numerous rounds of negotiations but have failed to resolve the dispute. Well, some updates on the COVID-19 pandemic now. Almost half a million doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine have been delivered to Ethiopia. Ethiopia's Health Minister Leah Tadesse and U.S. Ambassador to Ethiopia Geta Pasi attended a ceremony at Addis Ababa International Airport to greet the shipment's arrival. In a speech, the Ethiopian minister says the vaccines had come at an instrumental time when the Delta variant is ripping around the world, driving a new spike in cases. She adds that the country expects to receive 1.2 million doses, with the remaining vaccines expected in the coming weeks. Ethiopia will be receiving around 1.2 million doses of Johnson & Johnson from the U.S. government. 
but this morning we have received 453,600 doses of this 1.2 million and we expect to receive the remaining doses in the next two weeks or so. This also comes at a very instrumental time when the, this new Delta variant is ripping around the world, driving a new spike of cases and deaths in more than 104 countries and with a very heightened concern for this strain to circulate worldwide. Well, still to come on the program, we'll have more on the COVID-19 pandemic, plus timid preparation for Eid in Libya amid a difficult economic situation. Please stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. Still on COVID-19 vaccinations, health authorities in South Sudan say they have closed down all the COVID-19 vaccination centers after running out of jabs. The country received 132,000 doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine from the COVAX facility, but 72,000 of them were donated to neighboring Kenya over concerns that they would expire before use. South Sudan had a slow rollout of the vaccination program and the ministry says that doses that remained have been used to vaccinate more than 50,000 people with the first dose and 4,000 of them with a second dose. About 9,000 healthcare workers have been vaccinated so far. Authorities say three types of COVID-19 variants of concern are circulating in the country, the Alpha, Delta and Beta variant. All over in East Africa, police in Malawi have launched an operation to enforce mask wearing as the country battles a surge in COVID-19 cases. Over the past few weeks, there's been a rise in deaths linked to the coronavirus, with new infections averaging more than 400 a day. Despite the authorities' concern, Malawians have continued to show a reluctance to follow guidance, including mask wearing and social distancing. Malawi police say Operation Valen Mask aims to enforce the wearing of face masks in public places, but will also include closing bars by 10 p.m. each night and ensuring seating capacity of 50% in public transport. A curfew has also been put in place from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Away from the COVID-19 pandemic, Malawi President Lazarus Chakwera says it's unfair to criticize him for appointing his daughter as a diplomat. Mr. Chakwera says he has made over 2,000 appointments in the civil service and Malawians have a problem with only one person, his daughter. He says he's very disappointed. The president adds that he finds it unfair to be criticized for appointing a qualified person merely because the person is his daughter. Since the president appointed his daughter Violet as the third secretary at the Malawi embassy in Brussels, critics have been sharing his old speeches decrying his predecessor practicing nepotism. Since taking office last year, Mr. Takawera has made several controversial appointments. He has been criticized for naming a cabinet comprising a husband and wife, a brother and sister, and a brother-in-law and sister-in-law, and with a majority coming from the same district or his home region. And now Tanzania's opposition leader, Freeman Mbowe, says the Chadema party will continue holding meetings calling for constitutional change despite police arresting its members. Chadema claims more than 100 people were arrested on Sunday, but police say only 38 were detained. Reports say they have been freed. Mr. Mboe accuses the police of giving flimsy reasons for the arrest, adding that it was meant to intimidate the party. Chadame is set to hold a series of meetings around the country, starting with one in the port city of Mwanza on Wednesday. A push for a new constitution has gained momentum since President Samaya Hassan said last month that the process was not a priority as she was focused on Tanzania's economic development. Back in South Sudan, thousands of displaced people have fled there for, for their lives following armed attacks in western Equatoria. Many, including children, escaped fighting at home, with some having to trek 14 kilometers to camp in schools and a church compound in Tambura town. 
Many here say they had no choice but to abandon everything they own and run when armed groups descended on their villages in western Equatorial South Sudan, burning their houses as gunfire broke out. <laughs> Feeding the children is the primary concern for displaced families here since violence erupted last month. Many are surviving on the generosity of the host community and are unable to go back to their farms or homes. We are suffering with our children. There is no way to go to the farm and collect some food, like cassava or its leaves. We really need peace, nothing more, only peace. The UN mission in South Sudan and other partners are on the ground investigating incidents of violence. Peacekeepers have also increased patrols in and around Tambura. Thousands of them have lost everything have lost their houses who are burned. You can see here the houses are completely burned to the ground. They have lost all their belongings. They have lost their crops for spoiling. Their goats and chicken are roaming free. They, they really have to restart from zero with a huge level of trauma and, uh, and still wondering what happened to their families. So it's a very, very concerning situation. Various agencies have started providing food assistance to affected families. We've been suffering, running from place to place without food. But today, I'm grateful for the United Nations because they came to our rescue with some food items. The UN agency and other partners are advocating for justice and survivors say they are doing everything they can to ensure that the basic needs of those displaced by these attacks are met. The country's leaders gave assurances in early July that they would not lead the country back into war as they marked its 10th birthday. But the United Nations reports indicate that violence is still raging in some areas. Muslims in war-scarred Libya are preparing to mark Eid al-Adha from Tuesday, but few are able to afford the sheep or goats traditionally slaughtered during the festival. The guns may have fallen silent in the North African country, but its people are now fighting a deep economic crisis working, uh, worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic and drought. With only few people walking around sheep markets in Libya, Adha Eid comes amidst hard economic situations on Libyans who suffer from low salaries compared to life costs. Many blame successive governments for economic struggles in the country. Prices are high, vegetables, fruits and everything. Salaries are limited. The government must find a solution for the salaries, jobs and unemployed youth. They must look at us. Citizens are tired. We are so tired. Years of fighting and the Libyan state's division into two rival administrations have compounded a liquidity crisis, sent prices higher, and led to endless delays in salary payments to the many public sector workers. With many banks also capping withdrawals at 1,000 dinars, queues at cash machines are long, and Libyans are forced to plan their shopping and expenses long in advance. The coronavirus pandemic has compounded Libya's woes and cases have exploded in recent weeks. Last week, UN Special Envoy to Libya, Jan Kubis, warned that Libya's banking system will likely collapse if the country's two parallel central bank branches do not unify and stalled political talks could unravel a ceasefire. I'm concerned that although the ceasefire agreement continues to hold, notwithstanding minor clashes between armed groups and criminal gangs, the unity of the JMC and implementation of the agreement could unravel if the political process remains stalled. The JMC has a vital role in, in the implementation of the ceasefire agreement and its achievements have previously paved way to political progress. Every effort must therefore be made to preserve its unity and to insulate its work from the detrimental effects of the political stalemate and the standoff, standoff between Libya's main political actors. Oil-rich Libya descended into chaos after the NATO-backed overthrow of leader Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. It's been divided since 2014 between an internationally recognized government in the West and a rival administration in the East that has established its own institutions. 
And finally on the programme, spicy grilled fish served whole is one of Cameroon's de facto national dishes. But around half of the some 500,000 tonnes of fish consumed per year is bought from abroad, while the rest is almost all wild caught. Boris Kamgo is part of a government-backed aquaculture movement seeking to grab a larger share of the ever-growing market for fish. Take a look. When Boris Kamgo scatters food into the netted enclosures of his fish farm on the palm-fringed Dimbaba River in the littoral region of Cameroon, the surface churns with the red tilapia fish he hopes will help curb his country's dependence on frozen imports. He's part of a new government-backed aquaculture movement seeking to grab a larger share of the ever-growing market for fish in the country of more than 20 million people. Here, when you see the red, it's a bit like the Red Sea brim that you find at the market. But these are red tilapias. After my studies, I did a lot of research on the red tilapia, and I realized it could adapt to local waters. So I received the permission from the government to introduce the species here. The 32-year-old has traveled to China, Netherlands, and Vietnam to learn how to raise red tilapia fish and pangaceus, a shark catfish native to Asia, where he realizes it will thrive in Central African waters. Now, Kamgo is eager to share his expertise with peers in Cameroon and elsewhere on the continent. He trains students on how to breed fish at his company's laboratory outside the commercial capital Douala and sells juvenile fish locally, as well as to farmers in neighboring Gabon and Democratic Republic of Congo. We train our students here. This is a system I put together with retrieved local materials to train my students to reproduce the fish. Because where I train, the technology is more advanced. We can find that material here. So I decided to make a local system that can train people, enabling them to recreate it on their own. Market dominance is a distant dream. But fish farming is on the rise across Cameroon, with over 10,000 tons produced in 2020, compared with 5,000 tons in 2018, according to the Fisheries Ministry. The government removed all customs duties on imports of aquaculture equipment to encourage the sector to scale up further earlier this year. And that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenio Ali. Bye for now.